Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Remy. Uh, this is Kasia, and we are from Netflix Payments Engineering. And we uh, will be talking about scheme tokens tonight. You might know them as uh, card network tokens or network tokens. It is something we started looking into a few years ago. Uh, we wanted to share with you why we did it and uh, share a few lessons learned along the way. Uh, Netflix is pretty global. We operate in 190 countries, 30 currencies, and uh, we are a team of 12 engineers. The first uh, time you will have to deal with us is when you want to sign up. First, we have to make sure that we can offer the best, the most relevant method of payments for the country you're from. We want, to be able, we want you to be able to sign up. Once you provide a method of payment, we have to validate, make sure it is correct. Next time you hear about us is 30, 30 days later when we renew your membership. You're enjoying your favorite shows, narcos, stuff like this. You don't need to worry about paying. We'll take care of it. So the goal for us is to maximize approval rate so you get the best customer experience. One thing that we care a lot about uh, in our engineering culture is end-to-end -end ownership. So every engineer will design, implement, test, and ship the features that we work on. But another thing that is really key is security. So we, uh, you trust us with your method of payment. We have to make sure that we keep it as secure as possible. So to get there, we have to tackle the problem from many angles, one of them being scheme tokens. And uh, we'll see how that fits in improving Netflix security. So what exactly are we talking about? Well, let's start with a very dry, yet two colors, uh, the, the definition of what it is. A few years ago, Visa and MasterCard and some other entities sat down and came up with a new entity called EMVCO. The goal was to focus on solving security problems around card transactions. So it really is standardized when you have Visa and MasterCard working together on the same problem. The goal of that new technology is to reduce the circulation of PANs. PAN is a fancy word for primary account number or essentially card number. You all have PANs on, on your credit cards. So it, it seems fairly reasonable to want to reduce circulation of those cards because as we know, they're very sensitive. They're sensitive for you as, as a customer. Uh, you don't want them in the wild. They're very uh, difficult for us to handle because it's a lot of liability to play with card numbers. So to get there, we'll be using a, a new technology, th these tokens, and that data is gonna be opaque and controlled. And th those are two different notions. Opaque, because those tokens in itself, they should not mean much. You should not be able to extract information out of them. And you should certainly not be able to go from a token back to a pen. And controlled is a, is a brand new concept. That token is going to have a relationship with the merchant. It will mean something for Netflix. It will not mean anything for any other merchant. It will not mean anything outside of Netflix. And that, that is very variable in, in the world of payment. So uh, let's, let's take a look at a, at a real life example. So Jane, uh, she's heard about Netflix, and she wants to see what's next. So she takes uh, that blue credit card, uh, which is fairly standard 16-digit Visa card, and she uh, decides to sign up. So she will fill out all the information. In the background, Netflix will translate that card into a token. So what you can see right away is it, that token, the green card, does not look too different from the blue one, right? Uh, it has 16 digits. It also has a bin. So bin for uh, you know, card gigs is the first six. So in the blue card, that would be 4651985, and that's 422222 on the, on the green one. Uh, you can see that those bins are different, and that will matter. We'll, we'll talk about that next. She signs up. She's enjoying Netflix. Fast forward to May, uh, Mother's Day. And Jane is a fantastic daughter. She cares a lot about Netflix and her mom. And so she decides to uh, give the gift of Netflix. So she takes the same credit card, and she wants to create an account for her mom. So she fills up the information. And what's interesting here is uh, Netflix gets a different token, and that's fine. Uh, we have a one-to-n relationship with tokens. And tokens are linked not to a specific card, but to a specific funding source. We'll see on the next slide how it matters. So now both Jane and her mom are enjoying Netflix. But fast forward to November, something terrible happened. The card that she was using got compromised. We don't know who did it. We just know that it was not someone on Netflix. Uh, <laughs> So she calls her bank, uh, and then the card is canceled. She gets a new one. You can see it has the same bin, uh, but a different number, different expiry. And then she starts to worry about uh, you know, car insurance. She worries about all the websites where she has a card on file. Everything starts declining here and there. Question for us is, do we have to worry about that on our tokens? No. 
they both work on both accounts that she created. And that's a fantastic feature of tokens. Uh, so not only are they more secure, they're also portable. They are tied back to the funding source of those cards and not a specific card. Uh, so for us, it means better approval rates. And for Jane, it means a lot, you know, be much better customer experience. So let's see if we, uh, let, let's see how it happened under the cover. The card holder, uh, Jane, in, in the previous example, gave the pan to the merchant, which was Netflix. And then the role of the merchant is to be able to flip that pan into a token. So for this, we communicate with a token requester, uh, which is, in that case, would have been Visa. The token requester communicates with a token service provider. And then there's a bit of communication with the issuer. The token service provider generates the token, store it, acts as a vault, notifies the issuer, make sure that the pan is valid as well, and everything gets returned back to the merchant, and the merchant stores the token. One thing that is really key on that, on that, on that picture is the issuer needs to be involved. And again, we'll talk about that a bit, a bit, a bit later. Uh, I provisioning is something that I completely made up, but I think it's interesting. Uh, every time someone adds a card to a digital wallet, so say, for example, an iPhone with Apple Pay, what happens underneath is essentially the same thing that Netflix is doing when we provision a token for a given pen. It communicates with a token service provider and then generates a token and stores it. So if you're using Apple Pay and you go to your wallet today, you'll see you have access to the last four of your pen. You will also see the last four of your D-Pen. And D-Pen is uh, essentially Apple's way of calling a token. So uh, we've been collecting tokens. Uh, we've been collecting tokens when people signed up. Uh, that was the example with Jane. We've been collecting tokens for customers that we had, uh, that, that have been with Netflix for a long time. We would like to be able to use them. So essentially process payments using tokens. The merchant sends a token to the processor and essentially the relationship between merchant and, and processor, PSP in that example, uh, is very similar to what it is when we charge with a, with a pen. The processor will then communicate with the scheme. The scheme will communicate with the token service provider, like I mentioned, the token service provider is the vault, the one that is able to de-tokenize. Scheme gets a pan, issuer gets a pan, and then forwards back an approval. Uh, key thing on that, on that picture is the processor needs to be token aware. So you cannot just go out there and, and assume that any payment processor that can process payment can process payment with tokens. So we've seen why it makes sense for us to use it. Uh, and I think I, I painted a very uh, you know, glamorous picture of tokens. Uh, Kesha here is a lot more realistic, and she's uh, tell you everything about the way we tackle the problem within Netflix. Thank you, Remy. So we started our token integration at Netflix in the first quarter of 2017, and we integrated with Visa. The, what we did is we took our authorization flow, which is when a customer gives us a new credit card, we validate it, we authorize it, we store it for future use. And then we provision tokens for that. That test was successful, so then we followed up with our renewal flow. And in renewals, we have credit cards we already have on file, we provision tokens for them, then we process through the tokens. Um, in that flow, what we did is, if the token processing failed, we will try processing again by using the credit card number. So after that test, we also integrated with MasterCard, and over the last couple of years, we've been rolling our tokenization globally. And so what we do is we look at every country and see what percentage of issuers in that country have already integrated with tokens. And if that percentage is high enough, we will prioritize that country for tokenization. And we've been doing a bunch of testing over the last couple of years. So one test that we did is we tried do, moving away from that fallback to PAN, because that's the ultimate goal, is not to use the credit card numbers. We tried uh, processing tokens, and if a token declines, we will just try that token again on a different processor. And we did that as an A-B test, and we saw a fairly, it was a fairly unsuccessful test, so we turned it off rather quickly. Um, a few months after that test, we got an email from our CEO, Reed Hastings, and he's like, hey guys, we have this customer who emailed me, and he's been having such a terrible time getting his Netflix subscription renewed. Can you please look into that? So we did. And sure enough, this customer was, um, his renewal declined. He contacted the customer service center, they helped him out, got him started again, and next month, same thing happens again. So once again, he contacts the customer service center, they help him out, they're like, you know, it's just, you're good now, this is not gonna happen again. Well, of course, famous last words, it happened again. <laughs> and that's when he contacted Reed, and you know, not surprising, because that's a really terrible customer experience. Uh, so we looked into him, and turns out this, customers was, this customer was in a test cell for that test we turned off a few months ago. Um, and what, what happened was, one, we turned off the test allocation, but not the test experience. And two, the issuer for his credit card uh, did not completely implement tokens. 
So while we were able to provision the token, we we're not actually able to use it in our processing. So a couple lessons. One, uh, issuer engagement can be a challenge, and just because you can provision a token, that doesn't mean you can actually use it. And lesson two is clean up your A-B tests. So the other, the other thing that we didn't do early on is implement lifecycle management. So as Remy mentioned, tokens are portable. So if a credit card number changes behind the scenes, you can continue using that token for processing. If you don't listen to events from MasterCard and Visa on those um, credit card numbers changing, you will not know that. And one of the things we do is we show the last four digits of the credit card used on the billing history so our customers know how they're getting billed. And without that lifecycle management, that information gets stale. And then there's bins. Uh, so the first six digits of the credit card is the bin. And we use that for a lot of things. We use it for data analysis. We use it to route our transactions intelligently. And with tokens, the bins are not the same bins that you get with credit cards. And we have a wealth of metadata behind the credit card bins. The token bins, we don't. And that's something we're still working through. So what are the benefits that we've seen from using tokens? So um, as I mentioned before, we did see an improved authorization rate on both renewals and validations. And that leads to an improved customer experience. Also, the token portability feature benefits our customers since they don't have to come back and update their credit card. There's a lot of security benefits to tokens, uh, mainly being that without the use of credit card in your processing flows, if you accidentally log the token, it's not as bad as logging the credit card because that token is only useful to Netflix. And then with the, um, with the PSD regulation coming online in September in Europe, if we use tokens with the MIT framework, which allows us to mark transactions as initi merchant initiated versus customer initiated, our renewal, our renewal transactions are out of scope for uh, 3DS. So where do we go from here? Um, one thing that we still need to implement is the ability to look up a token by credit card, and that's something that we use in a customer service application the customer can authenticate themselves to our agents by providing the credit card they have with us on file. Um, as the token data ages, we will lose the ability to do the authentication. We also still need to integrate with American Express and Discover token services, and we want to repeat that test where we will try using just pens, because that is our ultimate goal. I mean, just token, not just pens. And of course, finally, um, with the portability of tokens and the n not having to, uh, not, with, <laughs> with the token, not changing with the credit card number changes, we expect that maybe not this year or next year, but in the future we'll be able to turn off account updater. Thank you.